So our next session is with two good friends, um, Evelyn Farkas, of course, from the McCain Institute, and Mike Carpenter, the U.S. Ambassador to the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Uh, we're thrilled to have both of you here. Over to you. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome Ambassador Michael Car Carpenter to this stage. Um, he and I have been uh, friends and colleagues for a long time. He's currently, as you all know, ambassador to the OSCE. I'm going to speak really fast because we only have 25 minutes total, which means I have like 15 minutes with him if I'm going to be fair to you guys. Um, but, he, but I do want to uh, point out that he has a long track record of working in this part of the world. He was my successor as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Russia, Ukraine, Eurasia and conventional arms control in the Pentagon. He, before that, served as senior director or director at the uh, uh, NSC on Russia. He has a long, decades-long uh, background working in the Foreign Service, posted to embassies in Poland, Slovakia, and I think Barbados. Um, <laughs> and uh, he's got a PhD, he's got a big brain, he's got great opinions, of course he's a diplomat, so um, I'll try to pull as much as I can out of you today. Um, let me just start, I think, with, uh, I, I will tell you all, I'm not going to ask about the future of the OSCE, though I'm tempted to as a little bit of a political science nerd, because I'm not really sure whether the OSCE is relevant anymore. It was supposed to create peace from Vancouver to Vladivostok, and we know what happened uh, with regard to Georgia and Ukraine, how helpful the OSCE was. Sorry, I don't, I'm not going to ask you to comment on that. What I want to ask you about, for starters, because we are in the Republic of Georgia, we have a big a group of participants and audience members from the Republic of Georgia, and there's been a lot of questions asked on this stage about the future of Georgia, Georgia's desire the people of Georgia would still like to integrate into NATO and the European Union, yet there are very real obstacles in their way. Number one, the European Union has put out some conditions that it appears the Georgian government may not meet by the end of this year, which is the deadline. Um, on top of that, there is a real sense that the Georgian government is now allied or, or aligned with, let's say, Vladimir Putin. They are not participating in the sanctions. They are accusing the United States and other countries of bringing Georgia into a war, which actually, oh, I'm, I, the interpreters are probably having trouble. Um, which actually the, the war was started in 2008 by Putin. So we have a situation now where the Georgian people and participants in the audience are wondering, are we going to be left out? When Ukraine and Moldova join the European Union, when Ukraine joins NATO, where will that leave Georgia? Well, first of all, thanks, Evelyn, for having me and, and David and Nino. It's so wonderful to be back here. Um, this is a great question to start. And let me start with the U.S. government's perspective, which is that we, we want and need Georgia to be anchored in Euro-Atlantic institutions. This, together with deepening Georgia's democracy, is deeply, deeply in our national interest. Uh, and so... For Georgia, right now, looking at the fact that there is a report coming out from the EU Commission in October, and then the EU Council will make a decision on their European future uh, at the end of the year, this is the window of opportunity. This is when uh, one would think that this government would redouble efforts, that every stone uh, would be overturned to find a way to, to march through this one window of time uh, which may not appear for some time into the future uh, and, and, and pursue that European perspective. And then the same is really true of NATO. Uh, it'll take, in both cases, a decision by, by allies in the case of NATO, by member states in the case of the EU. But there is, there is an opportunity here. And, and so the EU has been very clear about what's required. It's the 12 points. It's things like media pluralism, independence of the judiciary, de-oligarchization. These are critical steps that Georgia has to take. So now the question is, if, th if this is your strategic compass, if this is where you want your country to go, um, then it's incumbent on the government right now to really focus all attention and resources in making it happen. Um, and so we'll support the effort. 
but it's really, it's up to folks here. And look, uh, last thing I'll say on this, look, I know Georgians have paid a huge price in 2008, and they, they deserve to be integrated into your Atlantic institutions because they are European culturally, historically, uh, and politically uh, as a democracy. Uh, with, with some growing pains occasionally, but as a democracy. And so uh, we need to help them make it happen, uh, but they also need to take the reins into their own hands and ensure that this opportunity is not wasted. So, um, so earlier today, uh, one of our colleagues, it may have been Ambassador Muncio, who's from Moldova, of course, but somebody said Moldova is the example that 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 is an example to follow. Can you reflect on that? W would you agree with that? Well, I would say, and I just met with uh, President Sandu in Lake Bled a week ago, and she's really an amazing leader. And I reminded her that when I spoke with her the previous time before that, I was actually moderating a panel at the Globsec conference, and we were talking about state capture and describing all the problems to uncapturing the Moldovan state when it was uh, essentially um, uh, beholden to, to oligarchs in that country. And yet Moldova succeeded in doing what seemed like an impossible task in shunting oligarchs aside and their entrenched crony capitalism, their control over municipal officials through, through bribes and patronage and all the various other schemes that they have to control these, these sorts of local elected officials. And, and it's really turned the corner. And now Moldova has this European perspective, which we hope, uh, again, from the U.S. perspective, is, is realized with a, with a concrete uh, invitation to start talks on, uh, on EU session uh, at the end of the year. Uh, which is not to say that Moldova doesn't have problems, and they recognize it themselves. Huge economic problems, inflation at 30%, energy independence issues, uh, some problems with uh, independence of the courts, et cetera, et cetera. All of that is real, but if they're able to seize this historic opportunity to march forward, uh, then those problems will get dealt with in due time. And I think it's, it's similar here. Look, at one point, five years ago, Georgia was the leader of the pack, so to speak, between uh, Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, among that trio. So now, you know, uh, can, can that be resurrected? Can that momentum be sustained? That's the question. But I, Evelyn, can I just, on the OSCE, just really quick? Go ahead. You mentioned it. So uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Somebody so, has oh, to defend yeah, the OSCE. Well, look, I, I'm the U.S. ambassador to the OSCE, so I don't have to uh, defend the, the OSCE. I have to defend U.S. interests in the organization. Look, it's a, it's a tool, and it provides instruments. Um, and uh, it, it's kind of like blaming the architect for, for problems with a house that is on fire rather than blaming the arsonist who set the house on fire, right? So um, there's problems with the OSC. It's based on consensus-based decision-making, which in this day and age with Russia and Belarus as part of the organization is very difficult to find consensus on anything. In fact, it's impossible. Um, and yet the OSCE does provide a valuable tool to be able to, to advance our foreign policy interests in many parts of the world, including Central Asia, um, including in Moldova, and by the way, now also including in Ukraine. So this is, uh, this is the one thing I want to say about OSCE, is we have taken the bold step. In the past, we've always done projects, and, and usually small-scale projects, funded by extra budgetary contributions, meaning voluntary contributions from states that participate in the OSCE. And we've done those with like-minded partners, but they've been relatively small projects. For the first time in the history of the OSCE, we've stood up an entire field mission now in Ukraine. 75 people approximately employed in this field mission. It's called the Support Program for Ukraine, based in Kyiv. And it's doing incredible work in areas like demining and psychosocial support, and hopefully getting into the game soon on trying to reunite, re, excuse me, reunite kids who've been brutally separated from their families by, by the Russian authorities. So this is a model for the future. Be creative, work around Russian obstructionism, in the case of other institutions or organizations that are multilateral, working around malified actors that, that don't want to see progress, and working with our like-minded you know, friends and partners to achieve concrete results. 
that's how we need to approach multilateralism, I think, going forward. And we're, we're starting to do it in the OSC, and I'm proud of that fact. Well, I do think I have to um, also mention having served as a human rights officer in the field, in a field mission in Bosnia in the 90s, that some of the best work that OSCE has done has been in the field. So um, I, my criticism really just has to do with the fact that you have the wolf at the table in the OSCE, which makes it, of course, incredibly difficult to get any real political work done. Um, I but sorry, so j just to react on that too, yeah. yes. But the OSCE is the one multilateral institution where Russia is completely and utterly isolated. Really. Not even Belarus defends Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine. They dissemble, they lie, they spew their own propaganda about how they're not a party to the conflict, but they don't defend Putin's war against and Ukraine. Does anyone have a coffee with them on the break? <laughs> so... So we have made, look, whenever Sergei Lavrov says that the OSCE is a terrible organization because it's been hijacked by the collective West, that means we must be doing something right. And we are. We're isolating Russia, we're speaking truth to power, and we're holding them accountable every week. Now, I don't enjoy sparring with a Russian perm rep uh, in the Permanent Council, but as a matter of fact, I really don't because he doesn't really take the floor. So we're able with any number of different constellation of states every week, you know, a dozen, two dozen, three dozen, depending on the week, really slam Russia for, its, for the atrocities, for the war crimes, the torture basements, the filtration operations, all of that. It comes up and we don't, we don't pull our punches. So, you know, OSC maybe is not, you know, what people are focused on. It may not be the, the, the epigony of uh, effective multilateralism, but we do get certain results across, and it's isolating Russia is one of them. Okay, point well taken. Now, I, I don't have a lot of time, but I want to touch on a couple of countries and crises that haven't been mentioned yet. We are in the Caucasus. Um, we have not talked about Azerbaijan and Armenia. Um, obviously, the specter of Putinism also affects them very much, those countries, those peoples. And we have the flashpoint of Nagorno-Karabakh, which now, you know, some outside commentators are calling uh, a genocide, actually, the, the, the blockade of m food getting into, um, into Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, that was Nick Kristof, New York Times columnist. Um, on top of that, I know that the United States has been actively involved, much more actively than in previous years, in trying to come to a resolution to that conflict. Um, can you talk at all about the United States' efforts? Maybe not, but whatever you can tell us would be great. And what can we do to address Putinism and the way that Putin uses that crisis against those two countries and their peoples? Right. Well, this is an extremely important challenge that, that we face uh, right now with the humanitarian situation being as grave as it is with shortages of food, of medicines, uh, of basic items that are needed by the population, the local population in Nagorno-Karabakh. And so we, the United States, are calling on uh, the Azerbaijani side, but also on the authorities uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh to ensure that humanitarian aid is able to flow through whichever route, uh, uh, irrespective of the status that is associated with that route, whether it's from east or from west. It's important right now that we don't have a humanitarian catastrophe in our hands, and that we get uh, uh, aid uh, and humanitarian supplies in. Uh, and that civilian traffic, humanitarian traffic, commercial traffic be allowed in, no matter the circumstance. But look, you alluded to this. Um, who, who has boots on the ground? It, it, it's Russian peacekeepers, right? So uh, this situation is arising with Russian peacekeepers on the ground in and around Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, that's just the way it is. We're not gonna change that right now, but from the US perspective, we have an opportunity. This could be, potentially, if we get the diplomacy right, this could be a diplomatic game changer if we're able to have Armenia and Azerbaijan delimit, demarcate their border, and agree on peace and normalization of relations. Um, and that would, by the way, also open the door towards incipient talks between Armenia and Turkey on normalizing relations. And what a change that would make for the entire South Caucasus and beyond. And so 
uh, we're, we're going at this um, uh, methodically. Uh, Secretary Blinken has met with, with the leaders and with uh, the four ministers multiple many times, times. Yeah. many times. I get the press. Uh, it's not going to be easy. This is not, this is not an easy negotiation by any stretch. But, but we're trying, and it's important, and there is a glimmer of hope there that we could achieve uh, uh, peace, uh, you know, if there's the political will. It uh, ultimately comes down to that. Yeah, we have one young, very young audience member who reminds us of the frozen conflicts, and of course that is one of them that Putin uses as leverage on those two countries. Um, I want to also ask you about um, Belarus before I turn to the audience. Um, can you give us some insight, given the fact that, like me, you worked on Belarus, you traveled to Belarus, uh, unlike me, you have much more diplomatic experience, and now you have been sitting for, I don't know how long you've been in your job, two years or more, with Belarusian colleagues. You must have some sense for what to expect next in Belarus, because earlier somebody said, you know, the Ukrainian people don't want this, the Georgian people don't want this, and in the, when they talked about Belarus, they didn't say the Belarusian people don't want this, but the Belarusian people don't want to be under the Russian thumb. Can you speak at all about um, your perspective on what would be the possible levers for bringing about um, change in Belarus? Well, Belarus today, Evelyn, is one of the closest approximations, although Russia is not far behind, of a totalitarian state. Uh, I mean, in the sense, as defined by Hannah Arendt and others, of a state that really tries to occupy every sliver of independent life uh, outside of the state, including all civil society groups that have been uh, shut down, uh, individuals uh, like Alish Bialyatsky put behind bars, uh, groups like Vyasna declared foreign agents. Uh, I mean, the degree of repression, I mean, forget about the fact that it's 1,500 political prisoners. That doesn't even do justice to the degree of repression uh, that people are facing in Belarus. People are stopped on the streets uh, just randomly, and their cell phones are searched for not just commentary that would be pro-regime, uh, sorry, anti-regime, but commentary that would come just reading news sources from independent outlets is enough uh, to get one sent potentially uh, to a detention center. So we need to stand with democratic forces uh, such as Svetlana Tsikhanouskaya first and foremost, but also all of the democratic forces that are operating in exile uh, to hold, uh, hold out hope for a moment in history when there will be a democratic opening, because it could come sooner than people realize. And, and by the way, the war in Ukraine is very, is, it, I would say, and, and, and Svetlana Tsikhanouskaya says this as well, it's inextricably tied to the future of Belarus. If Ukraine is, and it's another reason why we want Ukraine to win, if Ukraine is victorious, um, Belarus has a real shot uh, at, at having a democratic opening uh, and, ch and, and having peaceful democratic uh, uh, change uh, of, of leadership. Um, but so long as, uh, as Putin is able to keep his, his tentacles uh, on southern and eastern Ukraine, that looks uh, increasingly difficult because of this degree of repression. It's a police state. Yeah, I often think we spend a lot of time on stages like this talking about all the bad things that could happen if Putin could win, like the fetishization of fragmentation and things of that nature. But imagine a world where Putin is, is, is defeated and Putinism is defeated. It would be a wonderful world for so many people. Um, with that, I would like to turn it over to the audience. I don't have the best eyesight, so just stand up, wave your arm, say your name and your affiliation if you have one. And OK, there we go. Ian Bond, I can see this far away. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Carpenter, for uh, saying uh, kind words about Moldova. Uh, the realities in the ground are more complicated than uh, pure reflection about the success of Moldova. Uh, my question is related to the, the oligarchization. This is one of the toughest conditionalities in Moldova. How can somebody report progress in this uh, field without considering the fact that in Transnistria, the, the elite or the ruling elite in Tiraspol is led by oligarchs? Is this not a responsibility of the Moldovan government, or should we treat this regime separately from the Republic of Moldova? Uh, the company Sharif, which controls almost everything, is a combination of FSB officials and extremely rich people. They are oligarchs. How do you see the progress towards completion of this complicated task of the oligarchization in Moldova? 
Thank you. Okay, for everyone who didn't hear, it's about deoligarchization of Moldova. How do you achieve it given Transnistria and its oligarch stronghold on the breakaway area? Well, thanks, Igor. I think it's a great question. Uh, I was in Tiraspol in February, uh, and it, it was pretty clear to me during my trip that the authorities there, Mr. Krasnoselsky and others around him, well, first of all, they're closely affiliated with some of the business concerns that you just mentioned. But I think those business, uh, that business empire that you just alluded to, referred to, is, is pragmatic at its core. I think they see that depending on how, again, another example of depending on where the war in Ukraine ends up, their future may be tied to the European Union and they may have to make some adjustments. Uh, my sense is that de-oligarchization in Moldova obviously has to include the, the left bank as well, um, but that there may come a time where they understand that the political situation, the economic situation is gonna change and they need to move quickly. Um, that time is not right now, but it could be sooner than we think. And so I think with, I think the Moldovan government is pursuing absolutely the right strategy, which is to get its own house in order, to pursue anti-corruption reforms, an independent judiciary, uh, to, to work with the EU, uh, and with the US, by the way, we're providing quite a bit of micro-financial support for Moldova, as well as humanitarian support, that they should seize this opening, and they shouldn't rush into any kind of negotiations in the five plus two uh, process, which, right now, given the fact that Russia and Ukraine are at war, wouldn't make any sense. But at some point in the near future, they may have a chance uh, for the reintegration of Transnistria into Moldova. Already called on Ian, so. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, Mike, as somebody who used to work at the UK delegation to the OSCE, uh, one of the high points used to be the uh, the work of the of the agencies, um, particularly of ODIA. And I just wondered whether you could say something about, you know, how easy is it for them and for the representative on the freedom of the media to function under the current conditions of standoff in the OSC? Are they still able to do a, a useful job independently? Okay, so the question, the question is about the media arm of the OSCE. Are they still able to conduct their mission? and the Office of Democratic Institutions and Human Rights. And the answer to your question is yes. They both do phenomenal work. Uh, Teresa Ribeiro, who's the current representative on freedom of the media, has been very outspoken on media freedom issues uh, across the entire OSC region. Uh, I think the Russians have seized on uh, some of her outspokenness and have tried to make her the target of a smear campaign. Uh, they've been uh, pretty clear that they will oppose her extension at the end of the year. Um, and ODIR has also continued with its work, which is, many people think of ODIR as the election monitoring arm of the OSCE, which it is. And they do fantastic work on elections, but they also do human rights reporting uh, inside of Ukraine on war crimes and other atrocities. Uh, and they work with uh, governments that are willing to engage for example, with Kazakhstan on trial monitoring and other issues uh, that could advance democratic norms. So uh, what ODIR does is absolutely essential. The whole, what we call the third dimension, the, the human dimension of the OSCE is critical. And for that reason, we fully expect that at the end of this year, the Russians uh, will obstruct, will block the reappointment of the individuals who head ODIR and the representative on freedom of the media, or RFOM, as her office is called. And so uh, we have some tough decisions ahead of us in terms of how we proceed in the face of that obstructionism. But, uh, but they're doing fantastic work, and, and for that reason, they've been vilified uh, by the Russians. But that, that, that's proof that, that, but they're, that they're being effective. Michael. Uh, Michal Baranowski from uh, GMF Warsaw. Uh, wonderful to see you, Mike. I, I wanted to ask a question about, you know, you, you made this uh, passionate appeal to Georgia to take, uh, to ch Georgian government to take advantage of the window of opportunity. So if you could, uh, that is presenting itself in the run up to the, to the report from European Commission. Now, we can clearly see that Georgian people 
would like to take advantage of this window. We can also pretty clearly see that that's not the plan that the government of Georgia has if we really go beyond the rhetorics. So if, could you help us think through the dilemma that U.S. government, other government, you can even put your analytical hat if you would like, uh, how should we think through this, this moment where there is this uh, gap, a very significant gap between Georgian government, Georgian people in this critical uh, geopolitical moment? How can we support Georgia in this, given this gap? Thanks. Okay, Mikhail is uh, alluding to the gap between the Georgian people and the Georgian government. How do we address that? Yeah, you're talking about discrepancy between words and deeds. Look, when it comes as a U.S. government representative, it's not for us to dictate what sort of government there is here in Georgia. It's up to the voters to decide at the ballot box if their government is not fulfilling their wishes. Now, you're right, the Georgian people overwhelmingly support EU-Atlantic integration. Uh, government is committed, they say, towards pursuing these aims. So we'll see. I mean, this is crunch time, right? This is, this is absolutely crunch time, in, at least in terms of the EU. The next four months will determine whether there is the possibility for Georgia to move down the path towards EU membership together with Moldova and Ukraine or not. Uh, Charles Michel just said last week that, you know, by 2030, the EU will either integrate new members or not. Now, I don't know. I'm not in the EU. It's not for the U.S. to say. We don't have a vote. But I take him at his word that this is a real opportunity. Um, and if the Georgian people care about this, there's, there's ways to make those opinions heard. There's civil society. Uh, there's other ways to speak out. Let the government know uh, what their feelings are. Look, I met with a foreign minister this morning. He professed commitment to implementing the 12 points that the, that the EU has laid out, three of which have been declared fulfilled already. So let's see. That, that's, that's the, as a U.S. government representative, that's what I can say is, you know, this is your chance. Let us help you. We, we want to help. So we can help with attracting more U.S. investment. We can help with creating an interoperable, NATO interoperable military force and, and capabilities here. We can assist the EU because ultimately we have the same goals. Sovereign, independent Georgia that is consolidating its democracy. So let us help. That's, that's my plea. So speaking of crunch time, unfortunately we can't take any more questions, but this conversation is the perfect segue into our next panel, which will be with Georgian civil society, so we will have much more of Georgia. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you for your time and for your brilliant commentary.